Great. So what do you guys think in terms of Tesla stock? Um, do investors now all agree or most of them are now jumping on this bandwagon that RoboTaxi is real, that it's coming? Like, you know, literally six months ago, people said this impossible, won't be coming for decades. Are we seeing a change? Do we think that at least at this point, given all these activities that I've mentioned at the very beginning of this call here, all the things that are happening, um, you know, lots and lots more competitors, a lot of uh, progress. It seems to be that um, at least the investor's mind, they're believing that this is happening. Regulators are proving like here you just had, um, right, you just had Phoenix Airport agree to have a robo taxi, in this case, Waymo, do curbside pickups and drop offs. I remember when Uber was launched a long time ago and there was a big fight to try to get Uber up, approved to be able to do pickups and drop-offs, primarily because the taxis at that point controlled that entry point. But now this is a, you know an airport. So again, a lot of these companies are paving the way. They're getting regular approval. They're willing to do pilots. And it could be completely opposite what a lot of people are saying six months ago, right? Then in fact, they're going, oh, it's going to be regulatory. And don't you know, these cities and states will say no. They're just going to take years for them to approve. In fact, the opposite could happen. They could be chasing and rushing and wishing to be the first because safety is uh, being proven and people are realizing that consumers actually like these uh, robotaxi services. Like, you know, these, um, the ones Waymo and crews that are out there right now in the U.S. cities, they're booked, right? A lot of, um, there's a lot of wait, waiting point, waiting times a lot of times. And so it doesn't seem like that there's, it seems like there's a lot of consumers willing to try it out even at this early stage. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that real quick, Herbert. So I think you're right. I think the awareness and the possibility has really over the last 12 months, just everywhere, mainstream media, you know, talking about autonomous vehicles, talking about, you know, a Tesla robo taxi event. I think that has penetrated the ether and I think that's out there. But I don't know that just this is just my opinion. I don't know that it's actually in the investor base anyway, reflected as a done deal or a done deal in the next short to medium period of time because you know the stock if i think if the if the people thought or investors thought it was a done deal and it was going to happen in the next short period of time then i think the stock would have moved kind of on that on that belief that, that and and so we haven't seen that so i think the possibilities out there but i still think there's a reservation by most investors that it's a guarantee or it's going to happen in a short to medium time frame yeah, by the way, Nick Gibbs uh, reminded me that when the when initially they announced 88, the RoboTaxi event, Tesla stock shot up, uh, but that it, it shot up the month before, he was saying. And so we are not yet at the month before 1010. And he's fully expecting that Tesla stock will make a move or start people start getting excited the month before 1010. That's what he thinks. Yeah, that is definitely possible. Yep. I want to throw something out here. There are times when Tesla across the board will have really fast rates of progress. And there's other times when something happens and those rates of progress start to slow. And when 88, right around the time that the 88 was announced, they were having a whole bunch of fast progress. The Cybertruck was being released. They were having great ins um FSD was doing really well and um, just a lot of things were happening really quickly and it made perfect sense for the stock to be going up, up faster. And several things are slowing down. They're progressing, don't get me wrong, but they're just not progressing as fast. And I don't think we've, we're yet at a stage where we're progressing as fast as we were around the time that the 8.8 announcement happened. I mean, I would disagree. I don't think I've ever in the six years I've seen the company seen them progress at this fast of a rate. First of all, you've got FSD. You've got this new data center going up at the snap of a finger. They doubled their compute again and again and again. FSD is now driving for hours without intervention. The team has put out hardware three and hardware four versions that are rolling out. They got the hands free out. They got the Cybertruck park assist. They're merging the highway and the city stacks. I mean, these guys deserve a bonus. They've been doing a bunch of crazy stuff. They're Hello, do doing you this. English? 
They're doing a cyber cab um, unveil. They've just got hold two on, Prime affordable Suite. models that they're going to launch at the start of 2025. I mean, I, I think the key is this with Waymo, right? I mean, everybody's talking about, okay, now you can have it drop you off at the airport. And by the way, it's just a drop off, not a pickup. And this is the reality of autonomous today. Yes, it's amazing, but it also kind of sucks. Before today, if you wanted to get dropped off at the airport, you had to get dropped off at the train station and then take the train in. So you're late for your flight. This thing is slow. It's dropping you off over there. It also can't drive on the highway, right? It can't drive on the highway. So now you're taking uh, surface streets. You're driving super slowly. These are little details that don't get highlighted as much, but they add up to I'm not taking the Waymo to the airport because of these factors. So the technology has a long way to go. For Tesla, I think, you know, this the hands-free product they have today is a life changer for people. When you've experienced driving for hours across the country, driving six hours from LA to Silicon Valley, for example, and you don't touch the wheel once and your car takes you there, there's nobody else who has that product. Waymo can't do it. Cruise can't do it. Tesla's the only one who has that product. And it's a life-changing product. So that's really what I look at. You look at this and you go, this is bigger than the Model 3. This is bigger than the Model Y. This is going to change the whole business. Now, if you remember like that famous Ron Barron interview, when the stock started taking off, he said, you know, the stock has been flat for four years. And now we're finally seeing it take this stuff into consideration. The stock was being valued in such a way that, you know, maybe the company's going to go bankrupt, $30, $60 billion. Once that sort of reality had set into the market, this is actually going to be a profitable product, there was a revaluation event. And right now you have a kind of similar situation where nobody wants to admit that Tesla actually is the leader in this field. It pains them to admit it, but I can't think of another company that's going to produce millions of autonomous cars and be able to compete at the level Tesla is. Thanks, Omar. Okay, Prime Suite, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, my main concern regarding the Huawei, Huawei, or however you pronounce it, is uh, if if you guys remember what happened to them regarding the Google Store, like uh, the Google Play App Store and the, their um, mobile phones, they were not entrusted due to the AI privacy thing and the issues and was kicked out. So how can how can you take their software into a car where you actually want to have like apps and possibility to buy apps? and connect your Apple and your Android phone to? How is that even like a possible in the in the States and in like in the Nordics where I'm living in Sweden? It's like, this ain't gonna work. So what do you think about that thought? Because I, I don't see it work as a software solution for a car that you're actually gonna like connect your phone to. Thanks. Well, Huawei has, of course, faced international pressure for their links to the Chinese government and the Chinese military. The U.S. government, I think, has banned some of their equipment, and they've recommended their partners around the world to not use Huawei telecommunication equipment, which is extremely cheap because of concerns that there could be a backdoor that the CCP could release. So the prospect of Huawei self-driving software in the USA doesn't seem very bright. However, I don't really think that's BYD's problem. They can just integrate with whatever provider there is. And I think it isn't really appreciated that Tesla has the only self-driving system that can drive in North America, that can drive in Europe, that can drive in China and work in any of those places without a need for intense mapping or anything like that. 
So if you're a company like BYD and really want to sell your cars globally without having different systems for different regions, the only option is really license FSD. There's nothing else on the market like it from a technical perspective. It's often different to tell because they all look self-driving, but there's huge differences between these systems. And and that's, you know, it won't, so just uh, three weeks ago, there was, uh, the U.S. government was saying that they're planning to issue a proposed rule that would ban Chinese software in vehicles in the U.S. with level three automation and above. So it doesn't matter if it's Huawei or others, um, the U.S. government won't let that happen. So luckily, uh, knock on wood, We've not seen the Chinese retaliate, and uh, they think of Tesla as a Chinese company, and they're you know right now holding you know opening open arms for them to get there and China. But Chinese um, self-driving companies will not be able to offer it in the U.S. Thanks. All right, let's uh, add up some more people here. Let's bring in um, Highlander. Highlander, are you there? Yeah. Hi, gang. How's everybody doing? Can anybody hear me, please? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Sorry. thank you, Herbert, and to the whole gang. Um, what, so what's going on at our kitchen table is, and, and for two years now, and this directly relates to the automated driving, my sister-in-law had to give up a good-paying job so she could drive the kids to school. A lot of the country, they've already started, some they haven't. And all I'm thinking is opportunity, opportunity for somebody because they got to drop them off at the bus stops or they have to take them to school. So with the aut autonomous driving, my sister-in-law can go back to work, even if it's part-time, good job, right? It's going to more than pay for the service by far. And then I'm thinking about, okay, and you guys know I follow, especially Herbert and the four of you, Dr. Scott and so forth, the humanoid robots. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe if my daughter was younger, I wouldn't just trust the humanoid, the automatic car, but I kind of trust a humanoid robot. And then you could personalize it. Like, I got a daughter, she's grown, but my brother, his kids, you know, they're mainly daughters. So you put a little pink ribbon or something in the humanoid robots here. You, you, I think you guys get my point, personalize it. And my last point would be, if there's anything we could automate, you'd think it'd be school buses. Unless it's a high school field trip or whatever. They're mainly driving on city roads or country rural roads that are always the same path. You reduce the population and I follow this topic pretty closely, as a couple of you people know. I'd just be interested if anybody else has any uh, comments on, you know, my thoughts. I love it. Uh, you make some very good points. I mean, some quick comments on my side is, okay, so what is, which is actually safer, right? Are you more afraid to let your child take a car that's got an Uber driver in it that you don't know who this person is, right? Safety wise, or an autonomous car? You don't know how safe it is too. That is very interesting. I'd much, maybe people would rather have them go to an autonomous car without a driver there. The, the thing about your comment about a bot being more acceptable versus a robot, a robot taxi, but they're actually the same thing. <laughs> it's the same neural net. It's the same software. So that's interesting that you think that that could be more acceptable because it's a human form, maybe. Like you said, put the pink thing to it as well. Um, and then the buses. It's just I don't. I I just think it could be the last thing that will happen because it's children, and that you know something happens that would be just a national nightmare to deal with that marketing and it's obviously more, more than PR, of course, at this point, right? It's just, it's, 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 it's going to be just devastating if something bad happened to children in the car, it has to be proven to be very, very safe before it would happen. Um, but uh, having said that local community drives in a, in a quiet neighborhood is often the first thing that's uh, automated, isn't it? Like these, these uh, local, you know, uh, golf carts that are driving around uh, a specific uh, closed, you know, community. Yeah, good, good, uh, good thoughts there, though. What, what do other people think? It's probably going to be more cost effective to have a robo taxi take kids to school than a bus.
Yeah, uh, if you want to have an angry PTA meeting, announce all the kids are coming to school on an autonomous bus. I'm kind of with Herbert on this one. Go ahead, Islander. You got another question? Uh, no, just a quick comment, Herbert, and thank you again for allowing me to speak in this nice forum. But I, I'm just going back to our family conversations in the fact that my sister-in-law had to give up or chose to give up a good paying job. And with the automated vehicles, whether there's a humanoid or not, she can go back to work. I mean, we had this discussion two weeks ago and they're like, you know about this. I said, well, it's early days. This is directly to your point, Herbert. It's early days. I think we all want to check out the safety. We know that Tesla's by far the leader of the pack, but when it comes to our children, I think we all just want to err on the safe side. Um, thank you, and I'll just pull my little submarine to the pier on that one. <laughs> Thanks, Islander. Okay, let's, uh, who do you have here? DM? Oh, I thought I already added him. DMV? DMV, are you there? Wait, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Yeah, so just wanted to speak on a little bit of what Omar was saying um, as far as, like, AI being trained. Um, I live in Northern Virginia. I'm from right outside the D.C. area. And uh, if anyone's been to this area, you know that we've got a ton of data centers over here. And uh, just kind of speaking on what... Omar said as far as needing the the need of training it's it's um it's something you know I'm I'm, I'm trying to keep track of three CRMs like they're all redundant to, to kind of keep track of three of them but it's it's you know it's something that that needs to be done um and just to kind of speak on as far as like companies keeping up Cruise and Waymo you know you got it uh, um, on target with that but um Something I do after work once in a while, like once a week, I'll try to, um, I downloaded the Amazon Flex app and like the Walmart Spark app. And uh, this, it's really easy. They have giant data centers over here, giant, giant warehouses over here. So um, I, I use FSD, pull up to the warehouse, pick up like 30 boxes. Um, they have a pretty neat system. Uh, and, you know, it's all done on the phone. And uh, I um, just, you know, plug in the addresses, right? That's the most work I do, I think, is plugging in the address into, you know, the car itself. I guess I could speak to it. I, I still need to get used to that as well. Um, and, yeah, I use FSD. I use it every day. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing tool. I think it's important to just learn AI. Um, kind of like Omar said, there's no one that like no really knows how to use this stuff it is um it's just kind of out there and it's just being um fed to us at a exponential rate and uh anyone keep keeping up is it's so hard like i had this really basic crm and now the new crm does everything for you you know and it's like automation is real uh whether we like it or not um you know, it's, it's, it's just gotten so indistinguishable, like from the human at this point. And just speaking on FSD, um, I find it hard, you know, to it, like I try to be the best driver possible. Like every time I get behind the wheel, like no matter what. Right. That's my goal. Let's be the best driver. Make it there in one piece. Yeah. You know, did, no yeah, matter you what. A, do you have a question or? No, no, that, that was kind of all I wanted to speak on was more like Walmart and uh, That's great, yeah. Uh, you, you're, Amazon. You're actually testing it out, and it seems to be working for you. That's fantastic. Okay. So Thank I, you. I have Thank a you for letting me speak. Yeah. I wanted to answer this question. So just yesterday, Elon showed a demo, or he showed a small video of him walking around the you know cortex of super massive data center here in Giga, Texas. And it's going to be used for AI training for FSD and the bot. So who can speak to this, um, Omar? Like the progress that FSD has done is based on the existing, you know, tech, you know, data warehouses that they had, and they were initially compute constrained. They're no longer compute constrained. 
But with the addition of this, how much faster could these new versions get and how much better could they get? Um, do we have some sort of estimate if it's even going to be needed for this specific thing? For That's what he's saying. It is for FSC. And they're actually using, aren't they, AI4 and AI5 there as well to kind of test it against the inference compute. Can you speak to how much faster yeah. things can get? Yeah. This is a huge deal, this new Cortex facility in Texas. First of all, electricity is way cheaper in Texas, which is great. They have a ton of space in Texas to build out. I don't know if you guys have been to the factory there. It's just absolutely massive. And, you know, there's something beautiful about creating battery cells, vehicle bodies, and training AI models to drive those cars all under one roof. Well, not necessarily under one roof, but all in the same place. So this is really about unlocking the power of hardware for everything we've seen so far has just been hardware three models. Even the latest uh, hardware four model right now is going to run on hardware three. And it, it takes in the hardware three images. It's trained on the hardware three images. With this new facility in Texas, we're going to start using the power of hardware four. So we're going to start using those higher resolution images. We're going to potentially start training bigger models and utilizing that extra performance power of hardware four as well. So that means that we're going to see another huge jump as this thing comes online. And we should see the first updates coming out of that new Cortex facility for hardware for cars before the end of the year. Omar, will it advance the rate of hardware three and hardware four receiving the same software? Yeah, both of them are going to continue to get updates. The California facility, which has about 35,000 GPUs, is going to be used to train the hardware three models, whereas the hardware four facility is going to be used to be training hardware four models. So they'll both be trained at the same time. They'll continue releasing updates for both. And in a sense, the opening of the Texas facility is actually going to f uh, free up all of the computers in California to focus on training hardware three models. But there's always going to be a gap, a, a delay there. Hardware three is going to get it later than hardware four. There's no way around that. No, I would think that probably hardware three might even get it sooner. Um, you know, both can train and release updates at the same time. So particularly in the 12.5 series where both are going to be running the same model, they should both be getting updates at the same time. Longer term, with the other uh, facility up and running, we'll have to see how it goes. But I think that both will probably continue to get updates around the same time. They'll be training in California for Hardware 3 at the same time that they're training in Texas for Hardware 4. Maybe it's a good time to ask that question because this is what so many people think. Waymo, Cruise, Huawei, Baidu, these are all massive competitors. And in fact, people think that they're leading. Where's their data centers? Where's their massive compute? Do you not need this at all? Is this just wasted well, Google dollars has by Tesla? a massive data center. Keep going. Way bigger than Tesla's. Keep I mean, going. they run the entire internet. So that that's not a great argument for them. But yeah, I agree. Will this help with the Cybertruck? I know for those people who own Cybertrucks, they're really anxious for FSD to be on their vehicles. And will the new um, data center help with that? Cybertruck FSD is about to roll out. And Chuck Cook and I had the FSD snapshot button, which you can press to send a snapshot of what just happened to the FSD team. We had it start appearing on our trucks. So... FSD for Cybertruck is likely going to come any time now. Uh, September starts on Sunday, and Ashok said that it's going to roll out in September. So maybe early access customers will get it, and then it'll start to roll out to more people. But that's going to be really exciting to see Cybertruck using FSD for the first time. And it should be pretty close now. We've seen Cybertrucks testing outside Chuck Cook's house. They're really at the final validation before they start sending it out. So that's going to be super exciting. I mean, 
I don't know how the team is juggling so many things at once. It's super impressive. Will they be able to go in forward after the first release of Cybertruck? Will all hardware four Cybertrucks get at the same time the sexy hardware four vehicles get it? Um, I mean, you know, different updates will be ready at different times. Um, all the vehicles are going to get updates, right? So most of this anxiety people have is completely unfounded. Whether you have a hardware three or a hardware four car or a cyber truck, all of them are going to get the latest FSD updates, the best software they can run. And you can kind of count on Tesla to support their vehicles for five to 10 years after you buy them. They have vehicles that are eight years old that are still running the latest FSD updates. And actually, you know, there's even a uh, legacy SNX running the uh, 12.5 right now. Thank you. Yeah, that's an awesome point. What I'm looking forward to is when the Bloomberg guy that's giving periodic analysis of FSD and how ready it is following Elon's recommendation, that no matter where he goes to test drive a uh, a Tesla, he'll have the latest build um, of he or she, whoever it may be, that they'll have the latest build or really close to the latest build. So there's not this huge gap like there has been um, in the last month or so. Thank you. So let's go to Peace. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you may have already discussed this because I missed the first part of it, but I just wanted to bring in the uh, environmental motivation and ask about that, um, that where FSD or uh, robo taxis are essentially going to be an accelerant to getting off of oil and how much does that accelerate things if it fulfills its potential. My understanding is there's about 1.5 billion cars. Uh, to replace those one for one, we've been building as much as 100 million cars a year. That's 15 years. It's going to take EVs, it seems, to be at least five years to get to that annual production rate, probably 10 years at best. And so that's why uh, robo-taxis would essentially be um, needed in order to get us off of uh, oil at a, at a best, you know, for climate change at a at a quick enough timeline, and then from air pollution, which is to me the real priority because we lose 8 million people a year from air pollution. That And transportation is about a third of that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I've heard Elon uh, repeat a few times now that it's five to one, right? He expects that a, an electric vehicle, a robo taxi, can equal is equivalent to five cars. That's based on utility. Right. Right. So there is another key argument for at least some people to uh, be enthusiastic about this development. Peace and justice. There are two Tesla initiatives that are happening in parallel. And when I say Tesla initiatives, they've been spearheading it. Renewable energy, especially energy storage, a lot of that is, is it cost effective and how supportive are local and national governments in a rollout. And as RoboTaxi rolls out with Tesla vehicles or other electric vehicles, that other component is, is the grid green? Is the grid available and burning renewable energy? And right. that's something we don't have a whole lot of control over, unfortunately. Right. As voters and people that can encourage our, our local and state and federal governments to get involved in stuff, um, we have a voice. We can't control how efficient they are. For example, if they had used their rural internet connection and just went with SpaceX, and if they had made deals with Tesla to get the charging stations out, um, we would have way more already in the three years the program's been alive. We'd have way more customers that are already util utilizing it. But instead, um, we're getting what we have now, which I think most people are aware of. It's really dismal. Right. I mean, luckily, uh, we may just win by the economics. I mean, solar and wind are now the cheapest forms of new energy. They're the majority of new capacity put online every year worldwide and in, in the U.S. as well. Batteries are the key to um, 
uh, matching the load, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Can we have, um, oh, who's next here? Oh, I think I lost the person. Let's get RSW up. Go ahead, RSW. Yeah, hi, hello. Yep, can hear you, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, uh, look, I know Tesla, it's you know one of those stocks you need to be really forward looking. Um, I just had a question, you know, once Tesla figures out kind of autonomous driving with the robo taxis, what do you think next, you know, is for that, you know, I guess segment of the business? Like, are, do they plan to incorporate, you know, AI, maybe using XAI as an AI assistant to better navigate throughout traffic? Any kind of expectations, um, you know, for that? Omar, do you want to answer that? Yeah, we have seen some hints in the Tesla firmware that Tesla is working on bringing a Tesla voice assistant to their cars. And you'll be able to say, hey, Tesla, and talk to it. Presumably, this would be powered by Grok. I think it's amazing how Grok has quickly come from nowhere to being one of the top scoring LLMs in the LMSYS LLM leaderboard. So it's, you know, better, for example, than GPT-40 in May. So I think that would be a really great sort of integration. And based on what Green and others are seeing in the vehicle firmware, it's in the works. Maybe a holiday update. Interesting. And, Thanks. Yeah. Omar, can you speak to the inference trip that is in the Tesla cars? To, um, Elon refers to them as, he thinks, one of the best that's out there that's been optimized. And so they're low power, but also very quick, right? So maybe even quicker, like if you ask a question, it should be able to answer much faster. Is that uh, the expectation? Um, I would imagine that the inferencing of the LLM will probably happen on a server and you'll use an internet connection to talk to a larger model than what can fit in the car. But there may be a smaller version of the model that you can download and talk to when you don't have internet access. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Gavin? Gavin, can you hear us? Go ahead. Gavin. Hey, thanks for that. Um, I hear a lot of stuff we're talking about here is like a far distant future stuff or we don't know how far distant in the future. But there's something that's happening right now that I think is really quite interesting in this space. And that is that as the cost of software development falls through AI, then organizations like Uber that have spent massive amounts of money um, start to see their moat emptying out. And you have other organizations that are more focused on driver's interests. And I think the alignment there is Tesla owners, many Tesla owners have a vision of the future where their car is out on the street making them money as an individual, right? They've bought the thing and now it's out there making them money. But if you're relying on Tesla to provide the software to do that, then in the same way as if you rely on Uber to provide the software to do that, then you're going to pay their fees and you're not really going to be in control of the situation at all. And I wondered whether there might be any interest or how people would feel about partnering with something like the New York Taxi Cooperative to produce software um, specific to the use case that you're describing that would allow uniform insurance across the country under one brand. And that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, anybody want to address that one? I don't know. That's I, 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 you, you were, I was following along really closely, and I was agreeing until you said New York Taxi Authority. Why would they be the company, the organization that you would even want to talk to? It would Just, feel like uh, a complete backwards move in that case, doesn't it? No, no, I, I didn't say the New York uh, Taxi Authority. I ah. said the New York um, Taxi Cooperative. Oh, okay. So, Who are they? Yeah. So they started about four or five years ago. Um, they're quite successful. They wrote their own software. They pay the drivers an agreed minimum wage. The drivers own the company. 
And that seems to me like the kind of model that you guys, the Tesla owners, ought to be interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's stepping outside the VC model and engaging on a smaller scale is more possible now than it was a few years ago, a lot more possible now. And two or three years from now, it's going to become really very, very easy for anyone to produce their own rideshare app using AI. So getting ahead of that curve sounds to me like a good idea Mm -hmm. and waiting for Tesla, waiting for Uber, waiting for anyone seems like a bad idea because the opportunity will be gone. Okay. Um, so I sort of, first of all, I know that Tesla is open to fleet managers. Elon has talked about that a couple years ago, but in terms of the software, um, you know, Tesla has been working on their ride share, share, ride hailing software for their app for many years now, since 2018. So it's not like you need to wait five years for it. In fact, many of us believe that in a couple months here on October 10th, you'll see that they've already shown you um demo like screenshots of it and they actually showed you a video of a you know like it's a commercial but you got a human you know girl woman using the app and hailing a car using the app so i don't know if i agree when you say it's going to take five years for tesla to develop a ride hailing app but i'm not uh, i'm not saying it'll take five years for them to develop a ride hailing app what i'm saying Uh is that the ride hailing app that you use that tesla provides will be subject to the commercial terms and conditions of whatever Tesla thinks um, you should do. So your profitability will be limited entirely by the decisions that Tesla makes. And if they want to turn that off and make it unavailable to you, they will, of course, be very easily able to do that. Unfortunately, I think that every... So if you want to suffer that sort of commercial risk, then, you know, that's 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 a matter for everyone to decide themselves. Every Tesla that's been purchased, there's a clause in there that says that you cannot use it for any other tes- uh, ride-hailing network except for Teslas. Well, then, I would say, as someone who's been working in tech development and investment and stuff for 30 years, you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're a Tesla owner, you can only use it for Tesla network. So that's... So that doesn't work. Like in a, a, Hold on, Gavin. Yeah, Gavin. Hold on just for a second. Her- Herbert, I thought there were Uber drivers who are currently leveraging FSD as we speak. So uh, it, it seems to be a little bit of conflict with, with the statement you just made, even though I know it's correct. I think it's RoboTaxi specifically, isn't it? It's not uh, ride hailing. But I don't know. Ah, yeah, okay. So I- yeah, I know in Australia Gavin, we have people. Gavin, I want to acknowledge this is an edge case. It's very niche, but I didn't know about the cooperative in New York and that they have this custom software. I think yeah. that's awesome. And those drivers can right now, they can leverage FSD supervised for their ride hailing. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Exactly. But, um, um, it's really niche, though. So that's I just want to acknowledge that. So I don't think we want to burn too much more time talking about it in this case, but it's a good point that you you brought it up, and it's it will help empower people. Just like when people have solar panels and and um, energy storage, and they can charge their own car and power their own house. That's a huge level of empowerment that Tesla is is helping humanity with. And I also agree that. FSD supervised is is also something that helps empower people. Right now, it's it's empowering people. Okay, we probably want to switch topics on huh, Herbert. Yes, actually, no. Thank you guys very much. I think we can uh, resume again next week. We covered a lot of topics here. Great, thank you. Big giant thank you to you, Emmett and Omar, and everyone else. All the questions. Robotaxi is definitely getting closer. We've seen all these movements by many companies. Um, we'll see what happens and it's coming soon. Thanks everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.